Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good afternoon. Welcome to Global Report. I'm your host, Lily Ong. We have with us today Mr. Johan Berger, who is the director of the Center for African Studies at the National Technological University of Singapore. Welcome to the show, Mr. Berger. Thank you very much, Lily. Pleasure to be on it. Thanks for being here. Now, Mr. Berger, I would like to talk with you about Africa. I know you're an expert in, in, in this area. Could you perhaps uh, give us an introduction on Africa first? Yes. Um, first of all, I think we must bear in mind that Africa is a continent of 54 countries and not a country. So when you do understand and look at Africa, you must understand that there are 54 different entities that you need to bear in mind, each with its own unique characteristics. Um, there's a couple of broad trends that we see happening uh, in, in Africa. First of all, we see that a population explosion. Um, currently, it has about 1.2 billion people. We're going to see this move to up to about 2.4 billion people by 2050. So that's double. R literally double and uh, will probably be doubling again up to 2100. Wow. So a massive population. Currently about 40% of them urbanized. This is going to increase to about 50% within the next decade or two. Now before uh, we go into more of these uh, characteristics, could you tell us how large exactly Africa is? Whew, Africa is huge. You can park into Africa, China, um, the US, Russia, Europe, uh, India, and still have a bit of space left. Oh wow. Definitely yeah. put things in the right perspective. Yeah. Uh, indeed, and if you bear in mind that you're looking at only 1.2 billion people, it gives you an impression that there's a lot of space that is not covered by people. But um, this urbanization trend is an important one because it's put people in cities, which from a consumer perspective, a consumer approaching perspective, brings about a change in strategy. Early on, people would have spoken about, do you have an Africa strategy? Which would have been wrong in the first place because as I've said, there are 54 countries. But given the urbanization approach, we see a lot of companies actually now developing a, a city strategy and, and not really a country strategy anymore. So if you were to go into Angola, you would not worry about the country as a whole, but you would look at Luanda. And the same thing when you go to Nigeria, Lagos with its 20 million people will also be a target. And that's necessary because every country is quite unique too, right, from Indeed. the other, right? Yeah, it, it, absolutely. Um, and what makes this more interesting is the fact that there is a strong trend of growth in the middle class. Now some people say, Johan, you can't really talk about a middle class when you look at the parameters that they use. So you also need to be careful which parameters you're using or which company that you're talking about um, who has defined middle class. So I tend to speak about a consumer class and this consumer class is growing strongly. So a lot of Africa's people, in spite of a lot of poverty that you do find on the continent, um, there is a growing consumer class with a, an increasing amount of personal disposable income, which from a retail perspective makes Africa an attraction for global companies interested. So, so just so I get the terminology right, is this consumer class parallel to middle class? Are they in the same grouping or? Yes, it, they would be within, but some of them would actually be below middle class. It all depends on which definition you would use to define your middle class. Some companies talk about between $2 and $20 uh, personal, dis uh, um, personal disposable income on a daily basis. Others talk about between $10 and $100 personal disposable income. So uh, to take out that confusion as to, you know, what are you talking about really? I, I prefer to talk about a consumer, consumer class. class. Then there's no um, sort of confusion mm -hmm. as to who, you, uh, who you're actually talking about. Mm -hmm. I see. Right. Now, um, you mentioned the demographics. Um, mm. So with that increase in population, um, I heard that uh, by 2050, one in four workers would actually be living in Africa. Is that correct? Indeed. Wow. Indeed. Yeah, no. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing. And, and I'm not really sure whether Africa can, at this stage of the game, with its current disposition, afford to have that many people. Uh, the reality is, is that currently you're looking at Africa, in spite of the fact that they have the potential to feed the world, are net importers of food on an annual basis 
um, to the tune of $41 billion. And this is half of the total, used to be half of the total um, infrastructure spend that it needs. Um, it's about what the, it needs on an annual basis for its total energy um, infrastructure spend. So, and, and this figure is set to grow to about $110 billion over the next decade or two if we go on doing what we're currently doing. So with this strongly growing population, urbanizing, um, and added to that a youth that is not willing to live in the rural areas anymore and they're moving into the cities, um, we're finding that Africa is going to find it increasingly difficult to feed its people. So, and that is why, amongst others, the African Development Bank has adopted as one of its high five priorities, feeding Africa as very important um, for Africa as such. And you would also find countries adopting its own version of the high five uh, priorities, such as Kenya, where they're also looking at feeding its own population. Hmm. Now talking about feeding, talking about food, um, Africa has such a large land mass. Um, hmm. How much of the land is arable? Um, huge amount. I'm, I'm going to lie to you if I tell you the exact figure. What I can tell you is that 65% of the world's arable land left is in Africa. Oh, wow. So there's a massive amount. The, you know, the reasons why is Africa currently importing $41 billion food on an annual basis, on a net basis, um, is amongst others the fact that you find difficulties in financing. They're using archaic um, farming methods. Um, irrigation is a challenge. Financing is a challenge. Um, using fertilizer, getting access to that is a challenge. Routes to market is a challenge. Infrastructure in general is a challenge. Now, one could say, but you know, this is a challenge. Why go there and all? And I always um, remind myself of the two guys way back. I heard this story 30 years, you probably heard it yourself. Is that the two guys went to Africa and they were um, shoe salesmen? And the one guy said, Don't worry, 400 million people don't wear shoes. And the other guy said, Start manufacturing. There's 400 million people that don't wear shoes. It's a great market. So, a lot of these challenges, whether it's roads, rail, airports, ports, energy, water, that infrastructure is a major constraint for a lot of countries, um, but as such present opportunities, not only for construction companies within Africa, but also for construction companies outside of Africa. Mm. And might you happen to know uh, what percentage of the arable land are being cultivated, are being utilised? No, I don't, sorry. No, yeah. no, yeah. no. okay. Now, um, Talking about uh, you know all this, the population rising up. What about the mm. demographics? Because here in Asia, we have an aging problem. Uh, mm. What's the <coughs> scenario like in Africa? Oh, well, we have the reverse. We have a very young population, where a large part of Africa's people, depending on what country you look at, is um, below the age of fifteen. Uh, uh, as in terms of general, the the median age we're talking about, depending. I would say between 19 and 25, uh, that's the median age. So we're sitting with a, a very young continent, which has benefits, but it also has some negatives. The benefit is we talk about the, the demographic dividend. That's when a certain portion of the people are below, 80, uh, below 15 years of age, preferably less than 35%. And then when you're looking at a certain uh, uh, ratio of the population, is not older than 65, so that your economically active people between um, 15 and 65 make up by far the major part of your population. Now, Asia, Japan, and those countries have a problem with this. Europe has a problem with this. Africa is not even there yet. It'll probably move a few years from now into this um, uh, frame where we are going to have uh, more people in the economically active uh, part of the population than otherwise. The challenge is that this grouping of people needs to be educated Trained. appropriately. And we're finding that a lot of Africa's youth is either not educated or educated in ways that doesn't really make a contribution. Um, we're looking at a scenario where we want more people with STEM education, science, technology, engineering and maths. Um, we want more vocational training. We want fitters and turners, mill rights, engineers, 
uh, plumbers, electricians, and we don't have them. So what we are finding is that also the youth are leaving the rural areas where they are fed up of sitting in poverty and watching their parents struggle for survival and then they flock into the cities um, where they don't find housing, they don't find a job and they become frustrated because as I said they're either not educated appropriately or not educated at all. Now is this uh, educational gap something that foreigners have looked at feelings because that sounds like an opportunity mm. as well. Have we seen any countries kind of going in and providing those opportunities? Seemingly not because the problem remains um, they would find a lot of business schools from abroad, Australia, this part of the world, from Europe, um, the US, that they become involved in countries such as in Kenya. So you go into Nairobi, you would find quite a number of foreign business schools and foreign universities involved there. Um, but not in the field of, uh, not enough in the field of STEM engineering, etc., vocational training. Um, but it has been identified as an um, area of concern, as an area of concern, um, but we do not see enough people yet being educated in those fields. Yeah. Some countries such as Ethiopia, for example, Ethiopia is doing a lot. Um, amongst others, you are finding them doing education in digital and robotics and that kind of thing, which is great, but not enough by a long shot. And that is true for the whole continent, unfortunately. I see. Well, I know Singapore went through a vocational training phase. I was hoping that, you know, maybe Singapore mm. could share some of their experience and, and expertise with them as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, we are finding that Africa's governments are sending people to uh, Singapore. The SCE, Singapore Corporation in, um, Enterprise, um, the Singapore Civil Service um, College, they regularly get groups from Africa to educate and train, and they see what can be done. But then frequently it becomes an issue of political will on the one hand, it becomes mm. a budget issue on the other hand, it becomes a competence on that part. Mm. Um, I'm in the process of linking up Singaporean companies in this field with African companies and enterprises and entities for that matter, that then hopefully they, they can collaborate and there can be a meeting of the hearts and minds and then that kind of skills development can be transferred into Africa. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Mm. Now besides the traditional, uh, so-called traditional sweet spots like oil and gas engineering, what are some of the emerging uh, industries that, that you see in Africa? Right, um, manufacturing is obviously an important one. Let's take one step down, looking at agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, in agriculture, the whole value chain has become important. Frequently what we have seen is that where there were uh, um, agricultural exports, it would be raw materials being and the basic raw commodity being exported. Um, a couple of countries have now mandated that A, you cannot import food products from abroad if it can be manufactured or grown locally. And secondly, you cannot export products if value added has not been done to it. For example, Rwanda, you're not allowed to export um, raw milk, you have to process it. Mm. Now that's the kind of opportunity I think that will slowly and surely but take place. But you need to look at the whole value chain from the side of um, original equipment manufacturers, um, farming, food processing, etc. Right down with a uh, scenario where I've said you import 41 billion dollars of food on an annual basis net then uh, there's clearly a lot of opportunity. One quick question before I'll take, take our break here is um, do you foresee Africa overtaking China as the world's manufacturing hub? I think it's less a question of overtaking China than um, getting support from China to do this. China's economy is growing people say it's only 6.7% or 6.8%. An economy of that size is massive growth still. Um, so uh, it's moving up the level of sophistication as far as manufacturing is concerned and together with its growing middle class, higher salaries, it's doubtful whether they actually want to be, be in a position where it will be manufacturing lower cost and lower end products. And it has been actually encouraging a lot of its companies to look abroad to manufacture elsewhere where you have cheaper labor um, available. And I can remember about a year or two ago, the Chinese ambassador in Ethiopia actually telling 
Ethiopians. But listen, this is all that we can do. We can encourage our companies to go abroad, but you need to entice them. Mm -hmm. And that's amongst others why Ethiopia's um, strategy of putting up industrial parks have been so successful and why they're aiming at get at getting Chinese companies to come and rather settle in Africa, settle in Ethiopia specifically as far as the Ethiopians are concerned, um, to manufacture there. Another point that they're making is obviously the fact that Ethiopia is part and parcel of the African Growth and Opportunity Act by, from the US, which allows African countries then to export goods tariff-free into the US. So it makes sense for China currently being targeted by the US for, with tariffs then to produce in um, Ethiopia and then to export from Ethiopia tar tariff-free into the US. <laughs> that works out. Well, thank uh, you so much, Mr. Burger. We're going to take a short break here. When we come back, we'll love to learn more about what the other international players are doing in Africa. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Cynthia Lee Sinclair. I am the host of Finding Respect in the Chaos here on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is live every other Friday at 4 p.m. The show is a safe place for survivors of abuse to come and tell their stories and a place for advocates to come and share important resources. All of my episodes can be found on the YouTube playlist. The latest events in Washington have prompted me to want to come and talk about the effects that these proceedings with Brett Kavanaugh have been having on victims of abuse. Hotlines across the country have had a 200% increase in their call volumes. A groundswell of courageous people are coming forward with their stories. I can understand their concerns. As a survivor myself, I have watched all of the hearings, and I agree with the general consensus that Dr. Ford was very credible. In stark contrast, Kavanaugh, with his arrogant sniveling, acted like every abuser that I have ever worked with right after they've been caught. I found it very hard to watch without feeling ill. It is infuriating to watch these senators cry foul and bang their fists while refusing to allow an FBI investigation. The fact that they did not allow the FBI to investigate immediately speaks volumes about just how far they have compromised their moral compass. Now, finally, with an investigation going, they are limiting the scope so severely that we are at risk to this investigation not being a complete and trustworthy one. They claim that the third accuser is so outrageous that she should not even be interviewed. I think it is important to take a sociological view of her accusations. I worked with teenagers in the 80s. There was a bracelet game being played in high schools all across the country back then. The thin bracelets of different colors were collected. Each color bracelet represented a different sex act accomplished by the wearer. Gang rape was one of the acts on the list. That was the sociological climate in that day. Kavanaugh lied when he was asked what the Devil's Triangle is. It is clearly noted on his calendar. He said it is a drinking game. It is not. It is a reference to sex with one girl and two guys. You can see him flush with embarrassment when he talked about it before he rallied and said it was a drinking game. He was under oath, and he lied. And that was not his only lie. So now the main point of logic is it does not matter about the he said, she said. It does not matter if you believe her or him. He lied under oath. I am appalled that they are still trying to ram this questionable man through. It is a complete outrage. Falsus in uno, falsus in omnibus. False in one, false in all. At common law, it is a legal principle that a witness who testifies falsely about one matter is not credible to testify about any matter. This is even a common jury instruction. I am very worried that the panel of old white guys won't go through the changes that this country needs to support women's rights and victims of abuse. When I look at history, Kavanaugh is an ultra-conservative. He believes in full presidential power and has a history of voting against important women's issues. And this is just with the limited documents we were allowed to see. 
The Supreme Court is no place for such partisan tendencies. At best, his beliefs are very polarizing. It seems to me there's too much of that in this country already. I do not believe it has a place on the highest court in our land. A Supreme Court judge needs to be completely above reproach. I have hoped from the start of these accusations that the good that could come from this whole proceeding would be to change the narrative about abuse. Well, I am encouraged to see that lots of the country is coming out to support Dr. Ford. They believe her and they respect her courage. Hopefully, because of this, the world as we knew it has forever changed, regardless of what happens with Kavanaugh. Now survivors can know they are not alone. They can come forward without fear of condemnation from society. If you have been triggered by any of these proceedings, I want you to reach out to your local services. There is healing in the telling. And I want you to keep telling until you get the help that you need. I'm living proof that there is hope and healing on the other side of abuse. If you would like to come on my show and share your story, or if you are an advocate that has important resources, please email me. I want to thank you for your time. This is Cynthia Lee Sinclair from Finding Respect in the Chaos on Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome back to Global Report. I'm your host, Lily Ong. We have with us today Mr. Johan Berger, who's the director at the Center for African Studies at the Nanyang Technological University of Singapore. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Mom, well, Mr. Berger, I would love to learn more about uh, the other international players in, in the mm. Africa. Could you share some of that with us? For example, well, you mentioned China. Mm. Could you um, elaborate on that, please? Uh, China is currently still the major player in Africa as far as trade is concerned. Um, one of the major players as far as construction of infrastructure is concerned. But it's not the largest FDI investor in Africa. I think currently still it's the US. Thereafter we're looking at the UK, then France and um, as still as late as 2015, China was only at fourth place. So. A lot of who is made about China taking over Africa, but it's still not the largest FDI invest, and as I said that. Now, so when, when did uh, China start looking at Africa as an investment ground? I, I understand mm. that even back in uh, Mao Zedong era, uh, Zhou, en Zhou Enlai was already taking groups over there since 1964. Yeah. Did they go in there at that time or even earlier? Oh, I'm going to lie to you. Um, as to when they started, actually, um, Probably, or well, I can think back, China has always been involved in some way or, na um, or, or another in Africa. Um, in the wars of liberation that China, um, Africa fought against the colonial masters at the time, there was always a China somewhere, somebody talking about being involved in Africa. So they uh, were supporting the liberation movements? Yes. So, and arming Africa and training its people. So, as far as I can recall, mm. that's always been an issue or mm. uh, observable trend. That doesn't surprise me because China has always been a you know, long-term strategic player. Indeed, right. indeed. Um, so, China is currently the largest trade partner of Africa. That, is, that much is true. Um, and doing exceptionally well from its perspective um, in, in getting involved economically and politically, um, providing diplomatic support and getting diplomatic support. Its Belt and Road Initiative is going off very well in Africa. Uh, initially, when you look at the plans, they were mentioning three countries, i.e. Kenya, Djibouti and um, Egypt. But China has always said with the BRI that they're looking at it inclusively. So no country should feel itself um, excluded from the Belt and Road Initiative. So that's always been my understanding. However, they've actually now recently become quite specific and said no uncertain terms, the whole of Africa is welcome to participate in the Belt and, and, and Road Initiative. And from Africa's perspective, China is very welcome to participate in the financing and also the development of 
um, Africa's infrastructure. Um, now, what are the general sentiments of Africans? I mean, I've spoken to a number of Africans, but I think it's a sampling fallacy. It's a mm. very small number. What are the general sentiments of Africans towards uh, China being in Russia, um, not Russia, but uh, Africa? Because mm. I've heard they feel like they're being exploited. Is that, uh, do you hear that much? It depends on who you speak to. Mm. If it's a government official or a government supporter, they would tell you, no, come on, we love China. If you're in the opposition, then you say, we're going to chase China away. I must the moment have just we take over. <laughs> I must have just been speaking to the government people then, because yeah. they were all in favor of China's yeah. presence. Yeah. It helps a lot to, to know who you're speaking to. I can remember the current leader of the opposition in Zimbabwe. During the election run-up, he was quite vocal. He was going to chase China out of Zimbabwe, as if he would have been able to. Given the fact that um, Zimbabwe, amongst others, is not high up in the investment agenda of the Western countries, so it would have been interesting to see to whom and with whom they would have been uh, would have approached to fall in investments. So it depends on who you speak to. Um, I, for one, have come across most of the people that I've come across. Let's put it this way: are quite in favour of what Africa is doing. I can remember, you mean China's doing? Uh, um, yeah. China's doing. I can remember a couple of years ago, I was in Reims, in, I think it was Reims, in um, France, where at the business school, this was now the topic, China uh, neo-colonizing um, Africa. And there was an African professor there, and he took exception to this. And he said, listen, do you think we're idiots? <laughs> you know, we can manage for ourselves, we can think for ourselves. So... Um, Yes, I for one, my experience has been that it's, it's, it's viewed quite positively. Um, and when you look at Africa, the guys that are getting involved are over the broad spectrum. You're looking at people in countries where I would not go into, and then there are countries that I'm very comfortable with and whose leaders I think set a good example um, as to what they're doing in their countries. Um, so, yeah, hmm. I, I think it's about who you ask. Hmm. Now, um, I know that the world is quite focused on China being in Africa, but there's mm. another player gaining in prominence and people are starting waking up to that awareness and that, that's Russia. Mm -hmm. um, what has Russia been doing in Africa so far? Yeah, very interesting. Everybody's looking at China, nobody's saying anything about Russia. Um, from the beginning of this year, it's become much more prominent, but not only from this year, they've been the past few years becoming involved. When Egypt developed its, um, redeveloped, doubled its, the, the Suez Canal, um, China, uh, Russia got involved, got involved also in the special economic zone. Um, and this was a patching up of a relationship that got hurt way back in the 70s. Are these economic zones around the Horn of Africa too, like the Suez Canal or? This is now in, in the Suez Canal. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's where it currently is. Um, but it's also, Russia is also now becoming much more involved. It always has been involved in the Sudan, arming Sudan and training their people, but getting so to a much greater extent. Do they have a base there now, I, I believe? Yeah, while well, they're looking at a base there and so much um, the, the president of Sudan has actually offered Sudan as a gateway for Russia into Africa. And I think he's actually also training the president, president security force. Yes, if I'm not yes. Wrong, yeah. getting quite involved there. Um, and also offering from an economic perspective um, has uh, requested Russian companies to become involved in the oil industry, okay. uh, where it also already has Chinese companies involved too. So um, in a certain way, Sudan then looking at getting both involved in his country to the benefit of his um, Is it pitting one against the other or just... I um, think he would be very careful to do that. You know, both those two players are not people that you take on, um, you know, sort of and play around with. Uh, both of them you can get hurt severely were you to do that. So I think he would be careful, um, but he's inviting both. So I think as to not to, to, to exclude, rather have an inclusive approach than playing them off against one another. I think that would be stupid of him. Now, uh, you highlight Sudan, and Sudan happens to be at odds with America. Do you think that could be the reason why it's you know, trying to foster warmer relations with China and Russia? Yes. Um, 
Sudan has been hurt severely with the sanctions from the US. The US last year lifted quite a number of the sanctions, but are still on the list of company, uh, countries rather that sponsor terrorism, which it wants to get out of. Um, and it currently, due to this, it currently has a liquidity problem that is quite severe. Um, it has been closing down diplomatic stations abroad. Um, it's closing down some of the functions of government, um, uh, downsizing government, as it were, uh, for the simple reason that it doesn't have money. Um, so looking towards Russia, looking towards um, China, looking towards um, Turkey, um, the, uh, Qatar, all of them getting involved, the UAE, uh, looking at how can they entice these countries to come in, invest, spend. It's a country that has probably third, fourth, fourth highest GDP on the continent currently, in spite of the fact that it has been the target for decades of American um, sanctions. If you look at people talk in East Africa of Kenya and Ethiopia, yet it's, the Sudan's GDP is higher than both these countries in spite of the fact that it has been targeted by sanctions from the US. Um, but then you have, as I said, these other countries now all sort of approaching Sudan and say, listen, how can we get involved? Mm. And uh, Russia has been Supporting Africa more strongly these days. Do you think yes. it's also part of their isolation from the Western allies? Are they seeking a new ally in Africa? Yes, I think it's looking at increasing or getting back to the days of the Soviet Union when it had massive influence in Africa. And they were a big staunch uh, supporter of the liberation movements too, I believe. As well, yeah. as well. Arms um, still today. If you look at the Central African Republic, this time with the permission of the uh, approval, rather of the UN, it has provided small arms to Central African Republic's government, as well as quite a number of advisors um, to help then the government of the CIR uh, fight against extremists um, in the country. So. It's, it's, it's doing that there. It's also been looking at, it has been reported that it was working with Mozambique also to get small arms development and manufacturing uh, up and running there. But this time it's not just military might, military projection, but they also got a very strong economic um, outreach towards Africa. For the simple reason there's a lot of resources that it needs. You're looking at uranium in Namibia, you're looking at platinum in Zimbabwe. Um, and then you also do uh, former, uh, not former foreign minister Lavrov is doing his utmost to sell China's nuclear um, energy facilities to Africa and in convincing them to procure nuclear energy facilities from um, Russia. Amongst others, a couple of years ago, South Africa was one country that said yes, they would do it. Now, sort of coming out in the investigations being held in the former president's um, administration that they actually had approved it but then there was a court case and the high court set aside this approval so Lavrov is doing his utmost um, he was there in March this year actually he I was think he went, it was a high profile visit he went to five different African countries absolutely and I think he's recently been there again oh. so uh, he's, he's targeting Africa in a very real sense um, we also visited Ethiopia, now very recently um, uh, Rwanda as well, Tanzania. So Russia is trying its utmost to, to position itself. It is also looking at, in Somalia, um, developing its own uh, port of its own. It's probably one of the big ones that are not in the Djibouti port. Mm. Um, China was now the latest addition. So um, Russia is looking at a, a port in Somaliland. And um, the understanding is that they would be helping Somaliland uh, gain its independence. It has auto um, autonomy um, from the federal government of Somalia, but uh, it's not independent. Um, so Russia is looking at that as well, which would position, if it takes up the pos uh, port um, or military, port, military base yes. in, um, in Sudan, it would have a presence at the beginning of the Red Sea right down south, 
it would have no release in the mid part and then the top end in Egypt and the Suez Canal as well. So Russia would be very prominent in that whole very important sea lane from the beginning at the Horn of Africa right up to the Suez Canal. And correct me if I'm wrong, even isn't Sudan also the main mi migration route from Africa into Middle East? Well, there's a sea that they need to, to, to cross, mm -hmm. the, the Red Sea. So from Africa into the Middle East would probably be, depending on whether you want to take a uh, flight to what, but land-wise it would probably be through Egypt. Okay, okay. Yeah. But uh, sea-wise will be... Absolutely, Sudan, just across that... Just across um, the sea. Just across the Red Sea. Okay. Now, if we were yeah. to compare and contrast uh, Russia's and China's movements in Africa, um, what are some of the distinctions? Would you say Russia's is more a, a mix of uh, business and diplomacy and also arms deals? Well, that would describe what's happening in, in Russia. You're not finding the prominence of Russia that you would find from China. Mm. China has 10,000 com uh, companies in Africa, of which 9,000 um, are private sector companies. But all of them report back to the um, Chinese government in a very real sense. Um, and you don't find that scenario from the Russia. Russian scenario. Um, so that one big difference. Also, China made a mistake in the sense that it would take a lot of its own laborers in the early years mm -hmm. and then leave them. But it's learned from that. Now, currently, there's still a complaint that China brings its own top end um, educated people, mm -hmm. trained people to do a lot of the work and it only uses Africa for the cheap labor okay. component, but the reality is frequently that Africa does not have enough of those trained people. Irrespective of which way you look at it, this is China coming into Africa and you don't find that same um, operating model on the Russian side. I see. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Berger. I wish we had more time. Thank you so much for enlightening us on, on you know, Africa today. Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me.